Um, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. So um, why don't we just turn there really quick and uh, stand for the reading of God's word. So Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together with the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin." For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for your inspired word. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and his letter to the Romans, Lord, and, and how we have been able to draw from it such deep uh, truths, uh, such a blessing it is to read your word and to, and to soak in it and to, uh, Lord, just meditate on it. Uh, Father, I pray that this morning as we hear from your word that you would teach each one of us, uh, Lord, something that you have for us. God, may we uh, move from this uh, edified, equipped for ministry, uh, God, and, and above all else, may you be glorified. Uh, God, may, may I decrease, may you increase, Lord, may Everything I say, point to you, God, and may at the end of all this, we just give praise and honor and glory to you. Uh, Lord, be with us. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, church. Real talk here. It's kind of a hard sermon, all right? For a few reasons. Number one, I got a bloody nose earlier uh, between services. So if I start bleeding, it's not because I'm saying something heretical uh, and the Lord is like saying, get him off. It's because I went a little itch crazy in my nostril because of allergies. So, preface there. I just have to make sure that we all know this, all right? I've been, I've been thinking about it. Okay, but the actual reason why this is a difficult sermon. We've been in this series called Theologian, where we've been taking a look at different theological concepts presented in the book of Romans. Um, and... W- We've been doing it like at a 30,000 foot view. So we've been, you know, flying a plane and then we've been landing it at certain airports, spending a little time there and then just right off again. Uh, We're not going like, uh, you know, cross country in a mallard and uh, not the duck, but the the camper um, in in a mallard. And that was a joke. Come on, guys. Give me some slack here. Yeah. Thank you for the pity laughs. Uh, but, you know, we're not going across country and, like, spending time with each community and, like, trying to figure it out. Uh, we're, we're simply just, like, taking a look at these chapters. We're saying, okay, this is the principle. Here's a little foretaste. Here's how you live it out. Uh, and so it makes it difficult because um, sanctification is what we're talking about today. And that has three whole chapters uh, that it's discussed in depth, just really richly uh, by Paul. Um, John Piper, anyone know John Piper? John, Pastor John Piper? Yeah, he spent five, over five years just preaching through the book of Romans. So we're doing like six, seven weeks, if that gives you any idea. So it, 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 just, it just makes it difficult uh, for that, for the fact that there are three chapters and there's just so much nuance and, and, and just really deep theological stuff in there. Um, so for us to sort of get a, a really good grip on what Romans 6 is talking about, uh, we need to just jump back a few verses to Romans 5. Um, and so we're going to look at justification along with sanctification today because you can't really separate the two because they both happen like simultaneously at one point, and we'll get into all that in just a minute. You'll, you'll see why. Um, 
So we have to ask ourselves, why did Paul pose the question that he did in 6.1? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? Well, we're going to look at Romans 5, verses uh, 18 through 21, but specifically 12 through 20, or yeah, 12 through 21. That whole section, Paul is addressing the Jews and their uh, supposed righteousness that they had from Abraham. So they had a belief that they were specifically righteous because they were descendants of Abraham. And what Paul is doing is sort of deconstructing that argument. He starts off in Romans 4 when he says, Abraham was justified by uh, faith. Uh, He had faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Uh, It wasn't by what he did, the circumcision, you know, the the law. It wasn't any of that, but it was by his faith in which he was justified. And then uh, Paul continues that thought in this section, and and he compares um, the Jews not to Abraham, uh, but actually to a further back descendant that's a descendant of both Abraham. or ancestor of both the Jew and the Gentile, and that was Adam. And so Paul is making this correlation, this difference between uh, Adam and Jesus. And and that's where we're going to start off um, for today is uh, Romans chapter 5, starting in, in verse 18. It says, Therefore, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also righteousness resulted in justification and life for all people. So Paul, he's at the end of his discourse here, and, he, and he's just saying, hey, listen, All of you are sinners because you came from Adam. It doesn't matter. You came from Abraham. You came from Adam. You're a sinner. Unrighteousness, that's how it entered. But through Christ, uh, righteousness can enter. Uh, So then verse 19 to 21, it says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I love that. So Paul is super clear here. He is making an argument that we are all uh, without excuse. We are sinners. We're without excuse. Uh, We all are descendant of Adam. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, We have sinned, and this is what Paul is saying. But then he says, you may be justified, you may be made righteous through Jesus Christ and through his righteousness, not by anything you and I did, but by what he has done for us. And, and then Paul is, is explaining this incredibly free and wonderful and, and kind of dangerous grace. And it was all because of what Jesus did, not because of what we did. I, I'm not rich, all right? I'm a youth pastor, uh, so if you feel me, you feel me. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. By the silence in the room, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I'm not rich, um, and some of you might be wealthy, but I'm not talking about you either. Uh, I'm, talking, I'm talking about like Jeff Bezos, kind of rich, you know, like hundreds of billies, got billies on billies, you know? That's what the kids are saying. I didn't, I didn't give them a new word last, last sermon. I usually give people new words from the youth every time I preach, uh, and I didn't, so we'll have to figure one out. But uh, I'm talking billions of dollars, but I, I do know people who are um, in copious amounts of debt, uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty common um, ac- across the world. Uh, so what I want to do is have us play a little game. Are you guys okay with that? Can we have some fun in church? Right on. All right. This isn't going to be fun for you. It's going to be fun for me, though. Okay. So we're going to play a little game. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are an individual who is in a lot of debt. And if you're already there, it's okay. We're still playing. All right. So just imagine you're in a different kind of debt. But imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment that your whole life is financed. You have a mortgage on your home. Uh, you have a, a car, a boat, a camper, a motorcycle, uh, all financed. You have a bunch of credit cards uh, where you put all of your groceries on it, and that's, that's how you spend money. Uh, you have lines of credit through your bank. Uh, and then, like, when you're shopping on Amazon, you found out that there's this thing called a firm, which is, like, free money. Uh, and so you just start racking up uh, the financing and debt through there. Uh, and, and, and pretty soon, your whole life is based around uh, lines of credit. Okay? So this is you. You've got a whole bunch of debt. You've got a mortgage. You've got an auto loan. You've got uh, credit cards. You've got all, all the things, okay? 
All right, are we there? Are we good? How are we feeling? Yeah, no. No, we're not going to be good in a minute here. All right. Now imagine for a moment that's you, and you're just chilling at home, and you get a knock on the door. And you open the door, and it's the bank. Now I don't know who the bank is as one person, but it is the bank is, is at your front door. And what they say is they say, your entire life is owned by the bank. You have no money in your bank account because all of it is just going out uh, to loan payments to pay off what you owe. Your interest rates are so high that you're never uh, going to be able to pay off any significant amount of money. Uh, you uh, are like bankrupt, you have no money. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, taking your stuff away. Uh, because you can't afford your house, so we're going we're gonna to foreclose on your house. We're going to sell it to try to get our money back. Your cars, your boat, your camper, your motorcycle, those are all going to go. Uh, and by the way, since you have no liquid cash, uh, CPS is on their way. They're going to take your kids because you can't provide for them. Uh, and, and, and then you're just sort of sat there like... Huh, what am I going to do? And then you think like, oh, I could file bankruptcy, but then the banker comes back and he's like, by the way, you can't file bankruptcy. And this is a hypothetical scenario, so we're just going to say that. So you can't file bankruptcy. You're in copious amounts of debt. Your interest rates are so high. You cannot get out of this debt. What are you to do? And so after the banker leaves and the lawyers, uh, are, you know, they're coming and all the people are coming to start taking everything away, you hear a soft, gentle knock at your door. And you open the door, and standing there is a man. And he said, hey, did you just talk with this banker? And you say, yes. And he said, you no, know, uh, I followed that banker around for a little while. He, he actually came for all of my things, too, one day. Um, but I was introduced to this man, uh, this man who would uh, just pay off all of your debt. He, he'll just do it. He'll just pay off your debt in full. He'll never be able to go into debt again because he's paid it all. Past the debt you're in now and the debt you're going to be in in the future. Uh, and all he asks is that you love him. And so you ask, well, what, what does it mean to love him? And, and then, you know, this man says, oh, just listen to what he says. And you say, absolutely. So you get on the phone with the man. You tell him how grateful you are that you're going to listen to him. And so uh, a few minutes later, you get a call from the bank and from the lawyers and from all the creditors. And they say, hey, your accounts have been covered. Um, we'll see you. I think for a lot of us, if we were in those shoes, it would be a, a pretty big wake-up call. Pretty big wake-up call maybe to stop spending what we don't have. Um, but also to show some appreciation and care for the individual who paid the debt for us. Maybe we wouldn't go into debt and waste more of their money, perhaps. I, I, think, I think it would be a, a wake-up call for a lot of us. Um, but I think, I think a lot of us just continue to rack up the debt in a sense of uh, sin. If, if you haven't been following, this has been an analogy of what Christ has done on the cross for us in our multitude of sin. And I, I think that we just continue to build this up. And, and this is the struggle of the Christian, right? We, we've been saved by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. And we just sort of go on uh, doing the same old things, yet we don't want to, right? Like, we, we say we want to follow and pursue Christ and grow more in the image and likeness of him. And yet there's this part of us that just wants to sin, that wants uh, to do bad. Um, and, and we just love to pursue uh, the crap of life. Uh, and, and if you, um, and you can't say otherwise. I, I'm going to just say this. You can't say otherwise. No one here can say otherwise about yourself uh, unless you are sinless. And what First John says that if you say you have no sin, then you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. So you've just lied and, and now you have sin in you. So either way, we're good. We're on the same field here, okay? Because of the boundless grace of God, because his grace is so free, the justification is so free that it's nothing that we do, it can be really easy for us to become licentious, which means uh, to think we have a license to sin, uh, where we can just go about doing all these things, continue to sin so that grace may abound. Um, 
And, and, and this is, this is sort of a problem that stirs up, uh, within us. And, and Paul, knowing, uh, sort of the thought pattern of you and I, uh, and his own thought pattern, all these things, he poses the question, should we, ought we continue to sin that grace may abound? And he says, absolutely not. Certainly not. May it never be. So how are we to grow in the image and likeness of Christ? And how are we to sort of put to death these things? How are we to stop sinning that grace may about? Like, how are we supposed to, like, put that off to the side? Well, here's the answer. We have to wage war. We have to, it's wartime. Like, like we're, we're, not, we're not living in peace and pride. Like, it is wartime. Right, right in here, in this heart, in this mind, it is war time. Church, we are justified by faith. Like salvation comes not from what you have done, but from what Christ has done. And in this sermon, we're gonna yeah, give give God some praise. Um, in this sermon, we are going to talk about sanctification. And what I don't want you to hear me say is that you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to be saved, or X, Y, and Z to stay saved, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Uh, What we're talking about today is a command from God after we have been saved, all right? I just want to clear the air there. It's not a list of things to do, but it's out of love, adoration, uh, and desire to be closer with the God that saved us and ransomed us from our immeasurable debt And we must wage war on sin. Should we continue to sin? Certainly not. Sanctification has a a few parts. Uh, The first is, uh, over here, is a moment in time. Uh, It is the moment when we are saved, we are sanctified or set apart. Uh, God establishes us as uh, as just, uh, as right and reasonable, and he sets us apart for himself. Uh, On the other side, sanctification is the end result or the goal. It is the moment where we become fully in the image and the likeness of Christ. This is the moment when, you know, at the resurrection, when we're glorified and now we're fully sanctified. And this whole portion in between uh, the, the point of salvation and then the point of the resurrection is what we're talking about. And this is the process by which we are commanded to undergo. It's also a process that happens naturally uh, without any of our doing um, as well. But, so, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the war plan, all right? We're going to lay out the war plan for sort of the in-between, because I think we're pretty set as believers on the beginning and the end, like, yeah, God saved me here, and I'm going to be fully in the image of Christ there, but what do I do here? What is, what is this? I'm walking around. I ain't got, I don't know what to do, right? Anyone with me? We all, we all strong believers? Any of us sinners in here? Come on. We don't know what to do. We're lost sheep. We need some, we need some good shepherds. So lead on, good shepherd. That's Jesus. Anyway. Yeah, I about started singing there. Who? Okay, so we're going to establish the war plan. You guys ready for this? All right, so the four steps to the war plan. Number one, uh, we need to reason with the word of God. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin. We need to resist sin, and then we need to uh, replace sin with the things of God. All right? So step number one, reason with the word of God. So reason with me, family. Uh, this is verse three. Or do, oh, excuse me, verse two. Shall we, hold up, sorry, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? All right, so Paul is making a declarative statement, a description of who you and I are. He says, we are those, we them people, who are dead to sin. Right? This is a description of who you are. Uh, so church, if you are alive in Christ, guess what else you are? Dead to sin. Dead to sin. And we're going to talk about this the whole time. All right? Uh, as we like to say in the office, D-E-D, dead. All right? That's how you spell it. You are dead to sin. D-E-D. There ain't no A in there. All right? 
But Paul is writing to a church in Rome that likely has never had an apostolic presence there before. You know, this church was likely formed after Pentecost and uh, from young believers. And so uh, maybe, maybe they're unaware of what this all means. And so maybe we're also, you and I, are unaware of what this all means. So verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Right? Because baptism signifies the spiritual death that, uh, and, and resurrection uh, that we undergo. In Jewish culture, it was the final ritualistic cleansing uh, that uh, a Gentile would undergo forsaking paganism and turning toward the God of Israel, all right? Uh, In the same way, uh, it symbolizes our death to sin, right? Because we have been baptized into death with Christ and then raised to new life, okay? Therefore, now, verse 4, anytime there's a therefore, what do you got to do? You got to ask what it's there for, okay? This is really good. In hermeneutics, uh, therefore, connects two phrases together. Uh, Conjunctions, is that what is it? I'm not an English guy. I speak it, but um, what is it, Megan? You're an English person. Conjunction. Yeah, there she go. All right, so it's a conjunction. It connects two conjunctions. And therefore is an inference. The phrase that follows is an inference of the preceding statement. So because of what happened beforehand on the thing above, this is what we're going to to look at, okay? So therefore, because we were baptized in Christ Jesus' death, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. You see, Christ didn't just pay off all of our debt for us to continue racking it up, right? For us to keep doing the same old, same old. Uh, He said that he came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. So he is giving us a new life, a new path at life, not for us to sit in our same old sin, but to change the way. He, he came to show us a new way, to lead us in a new way, to do something different that was against the grain, to show us a way that leads to everlasting life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, this is verse 5, we certainly also will be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Listen, church, our sinful selves have been crucified on the cross and died with Christ. uh, Excuse me. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate you, brother that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Church, um, yeah, just give, give God some glory for the word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep saying this throughout the sermon. Uh, I love it when you guys clap. It makes me feel really good. Um, but it's nothing that I've done, okay? It's all, it's all about Christ. Uh, so direct your praise and honor towards him. Uh, what I'm saying is just, is just from the word of God. So uh, give, him, give him some glory and give him some honor. So I just need to throw that out there. Um, just want to stay humble. Um, before, Christ, before Christ, you and I, uh, we, we didn't have this thing called free will, as a lot of people describe it. Uh, Free will and predestination both exist. Uh, I'm opening up some box of worms, uh, but Pastor Jeff isn't here right now to sort of kick me off the stage. Uh, So if you're confused and you want to know more, next week we're doing a QA. and a And so you can actually submit your questions, and then we'll answer them then. Uh, So if I say anything kind of out of pocket and you're like, whoa, what do you say? I want to know more. Write it down. We'll get to it next week. All right? Um, But free will and predestination both exist at the same time. Um, But free will as we know it, kind of as it's been described, is sort of kind of out there, all right? Uh, Because before Christ, it says that we were slaves, slaves to sin. And, And this master called sin is not a kind master. He dictates what we must do, when we must do it, how we must do it. Like, he is a slave master. He's not kind. He beats us. He is not a kind master. 
All right? Uh, there are three ways in which you can get out of slavery. You guys want to know what those are? Number one is the master sets you free. Number two is you escape. And number three, you die. Those are the three ways. So let's walk through these really quick. The master sets you free. Sin is not a very nice master. Uh, We know that his end goal is to see you dead and separated from God because he hates you. Sin hates you. And we're adding personification to sin, and I'm just describing the characteristics of the devil to, to sin. Okay, so this is who I'm talking about. So sin hates you. He wants to see you dead. He wants to see you destroyed. He will not release you from his hand. Okay, so that's out of the question. What about escaping sin? Has anyone tried to escape sin before? Anyone tried to quit something before? Uh, and it just didn't go away? like before Christ, right? That's the law, kind of. It's like, uh, you know, don't sin, don't do that, don't do X, Y, and Z. Sure, I didn't do it. Maybe I stopped, but I did it in the past. How am I to escape? Uh, Anyone read Pilgrim's Progress before? Pilgrim's Progress, yeah, Luke's back there clapping. We're doing it in discipleship. Sin, uh, you should really read it. I'm gonna give you a little section from it real quick. Sin is a lot like dust in a room. Uh, that gets caked on after a while, and, and there's a lot of it. And, and the law uh, is what comes in, and it begins to sweep. And what happens when you sweep a dusty room? Dust goes everywhere, right? No? Am I wrong? No, dust goes everywhere, right? And, and what does it do? It kind of chokes you out, especially if there's a lot of dust. Uh, so what do you have to do to get rid of dust in a dusty room if the sweeping isn't working? What? Missed it. Yeah, you were in the last service. Okay. You spray some mist on it, right? And that's the grace of the gospel that helps us clean it away. But um, we're still slaves. We haven't escaped slavery yet. Uh, So we don't know Christ in this analogy. So the grace of God hasn't entered in. So then this thing can't be swept away. So escape isn't the answer. So, So the third option is death. Death is the only escape the only way for manumission to occur. That just means freeing of slaves. I learned that. I learned that yesterday. That was pretty cool, that word. Manumission, you can write that down. Spelled exactly as it sounds. Just don't ask me to spell it because um, I don't know how to spell. Um, anyway, but death is the only way. And so we can either die in our sin uh, but when that happens, the, the master sin wins, and uh, we are separated from God eternally. Or we can die to sin and be alive to God in Christ Jesus. And when, and when we experience a physical death, we will be united with him. So death is the only doorway out of this slavery. We must reason with the word of God. When it says that we are dead to sin, surely it means we are dead to sin. Amen? And and I want you to understand this so much, church, because if we don't understand the basic concept of this, that you are dead to sin, descriptive, uh, then the rest of the things that come after this aren't going to make a whole lot of sense to you, and it's going to be overwhelming. So church, re- remember this promise. You, right now, in this very moment, if you are in Christ, are dead to sin. All right? Amen. Let's take a break from this deep stuff for a second. One of my favorite directors um, directed two movies that I really love. Uh, the first one being The Green Mile. You guys know The Green Mile? And the second being Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Um, Don't go home and watch the Shawshank Redemption with your kids because it is uh, graphic. Um, So this is your warning. Don't do it. No laughs? Good. All right. Just cross that joke out of there. All right. See, and that's how you get back. All right. But Shawshank Redemption, uh, I was thinking about the other day because I think Pat, Sophie, and I were talking about it as one of our favorite movies. And... uh, I was reminded when talking about sanctification, uh, the librarian in Shawshank, Brooks, you guys remember him, had the little crow and uh, went a little crazy there at the end. Um, he, was, he was a lifelong prisoner, right? Life, lifelong prisoner. And the parole board finally granted him freedom. 
And so he gets out, he gets out of prison, and he's sort of in the real world, um, and he sees these cars driving around, but cars really weren't a thing when he went into prison, and so he's like trying to figure out how to live with those. Um, you know, the prison had a very strict schedule of when you could use the bathroom or, or do uh, X, Y, or Z, whatever, and so he is, his whole life is like controlled by his former schedule in prison. And, and I was thinking about, I was thinking about this, this circumstance he was in. And I, I started to consider that I think you and I are a lot like Brooks. I think you and I are a lot like Brooks. You see, when Christ set us free, when we, he said we were dead to sin and set us free from this slavery, I think what we have done is, is we've tried to emulate uh, the chains of the prison in our new freedom. I think we've tried to emulate the same schedule that we used to have, the same meals that we used to have. These are all analogies for sin, okay? Uh, I think we've tried to emulate these things in our newfound life with Christ. Uh, and, and it's because the prison was comfortable. The chains were comfortable. You know, you spend so long in, in the chains and, and you don't know anything else. Uh, and so when you experience something new, uh, you go back to, even though the, it was harmful, you go back to the chains that once ruled over you. And uh, it's a sad story because in the end, uh, Brooks ended up taking his own life because he couldn't cope with the change. He couldn't cope with the fact that his chains weren't with him anymore. And this is common even in real life. Uh, I mean, former prisoners ha- have a higher likelihood of going back to a prison, not because they just want to commit crimes, but because the outside world is, is a little bit scary and harder compared to prison. In prison, life is a little easier. It's a little bit more comfortable. The chains are there. And, and then, you know, we see everyone around us not struggling with some of the stuff we are. You know, we come to church on a Sunday, it's like, man, everyone seems so happy. Everyone seems so kind. It seems like nobody has any real problems going on. Um, and, and, like, we just feel alone and lonely. And so we turn back to our prison that we might receive some sort of comfort. It's, it's one thing to understand what it means to be dead to sin. Like, sure, I'm dead to sin. But it's another thing to actually know what it it causes us to do or know what it means for us, how we live it out. And and here's what verse 10 says. In the same way, reckon yourself dead to sin but alive to Christ. That word reckon, really it means consider or count yourself as. Count yourself as dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourself dead to sin. And the second part, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, is so important. You know, I don't understand psychology all the time, uh, but I know that negatives, like negative reinforcement, Jake was just telling me about this, uh, that negative reinforcement uh, makes us focus on the negative, uh, and then we just sort of end up stumbling back into the negative. So, like, if we focus just on how prideful we are, and we say, I need to kill this pride, it's, it's discouraging. But as we get to know Christ and we, and we pursue him, um, we become conscious of our pridefulness and our impatience, for example. Uh, and, and as we grow with him, uh, they're presented opportunities to grow in humility and grow in patience. Not just because impatience and pride are bad, but because patience and humility are life-giving. You see, this is the abundant life that God has called us to is to live a life of, of humility, of patience, uh, of love, joy, peace, all, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit. Like, these are the things that bring life. So it's not just about killing the bad, but it's about pursuing the good while also striking down the bad. So that's all well and great, but how do we do this? I think that's really the question that we've been building up to get to, and I have about 10 minutes to answer that. Um, That's really the question. How do we go about doing this? How do I go from running back to my old chains to uh, putting sin to sleep? And by sleep, I mean putting sin to death in my life. 
Uh, well, we, we've looked at the first two. We have to reason with the word of God and understand that we are dead to sin. Listen, it is not about what you do. It's about what's already been done. You didn't earn it, all right, church? You didn't earn your salvation. It was a free gift to you. So if you didn't earn it, there's nothing you can do to lose it, right? If you didn't earn it, there's nothing you can do to have it stripped away from you. I know that from Romans 8. It says, For I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor power nor any created thing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and that's the word. And so I'm opening up another box of worms that I'm not going to have time to answer. But again, next week, Q&A, write the answer. We'll get to it. So number one, we must reason with the word of God. And number two, we must consider ourselves as dead to sin. Because he has set us free, we are free. Therefore, we ought to live like we're free. And then number three, once we've reasoned with the word of God, and once we've reckoned ourselves dead to sin, we can begin resisting sin. Therefore, again, always figure out what the therefore is there for. Therefore, because you're dead to sin, and because we now consider ourselves dead to sin, we do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you obey its evil desires. Listen, church, I am persuaded that when we sin, it is a willful choice of disobedience. We have the choice between doing what is good and what is reasonable and what is just and what is God-honoring and doing what is, what is abhorrent to God. We have a choice. And we choose between each. You see, when we were slaves to sin, we didn't have a choice. There was nothing we could do. We just had to sin because we were mastered by it and a slave to it. But when Christ ransomed us from that slavery, we were given a new nature and we were given a new option to pursue the righteous thing. And so when Paul is saying, therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, like this isn't up for debate. Like it's right here in the book, and that's what, make this, that's what makes this hard. It's right here in the book, and Paul says, don't let it happen. How do we do that? That's the other question. I think that's the question that you and I have been wrestling with for a very long time. How do we ensure that sin, that we resist it? Here's what we do. We're going to pretend that that pillar is a line. And on this side of the room is sin. And this side of the room is righteousness. All right? What we're going to do is we're going to stay away from sin. This is, this is the resist. This is number one under there. Stay away from sin. And this dividing line right here is the threshold from crossing over from righteousness into sinfulness, okay? And I think what a lot of us do is we just ride on up to this line and we're like, oh man, I want to get see how close I can get to here. All the fun's right here. I can't go over though because that's sin. Can't go over it. So I'm just going to stay right here and then you know, pretty soon you're stumbling over. Let me give you a, good, a few prat- practical uh, things here. Um, you might be under... Uh, you, you might be an individual who um, was like I was in college, where um, you know the moment alcohol touches your lips, you turn into a party goblin. Um, and so riding the line right here uh, and being close to going over is simply just having a sip of any sort of alcohol. And then uh, your weakness of your flesh just sends you into a sinful binge rage. Um, okay? This might be you. And so what you have to do in order to not cross the line is take a step away and say, hey, I'm not going to go in a bar. I'm not going to go in a liquor store. I'm not going to go into the, the beer section of Casey's or, or anything like that. I'm going to stay away from sin. I'm going to start drawing lines to keep me as far away from it as possible. All right? And, and, and listen, I'm not saying this is law now, like, hey, you can't have anything. What I'm saying is, is if, if you're that type of person that goes into that state where even one is too much for you, then just stay away from it. It's all about your own conscience, all right? Just like, just don't sin. <laughs> stay away from it. Now, uh, men and women in the room, um, let's, talk about, let's talk about pornography for a second. 
This is becoming an increasingly prevalent thing in the church. Nearly 66% of men struggle with it, and nearly a third of women struggle with it. Um, If it's a struggle for you, and you have an iPhone with free internet access and reign to anything you could ever want, you're probably standing on this line right now. And so what can you do to sort of take a step away from it? Well, you can have someone in control of your phone through screen time. You can use different apps. Or you can cut off opportunity and throw your iPhone out the window. Okay? We, can, we don't need them. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but we don't need smartphones. We can deal with flip phones again. We don't need computers. Uh, the second thing we can do in order to resist is to cut off opportunity. Jesus said, if your left hand causes you to stumble, what? Cut it off. Cut off the opportunity for sin to come in. And, and that might look like never driving past another liquor store or another Walmart again. You might have to set up serious restrictions to keep your distance and to kill sin in your life. Uh, but hey, it's not me telling you to do it. It's the book. It's God telling us this is what we must do. Put to death sin. Therefore, reckon yourself, consider yourself dead to it. And don't let it reign in your mortal body. The third thing you can do is you can foster accountability. You can ask someone in your life uh, to hold you accountable. This can be a a brother or sister in Christ uh, who is older than you or maybe spiritually more mature. And you can say, I need you to beat me up and tell me what I'm doing wrong and to hold me accountable for what I'm doing. We have something uh, at Restore called Wonderful Wounds. All right, It's where we give each other wounds that are wonderful. wonderful. It says, um, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. And we sharpen one another up. All right, so foster accountability. Put someone in your life who is close to you, who knows you well, who can know when you're lying, right? Who can know when you're, uh, okay, when you're full of it, yeah. Put someone in your life who can call you out, call you to repentance, and help you grow more in the image and likeness of God. Listen. That's, that's it, really. Like, like, that's what we have to do. We just have to resist sin. You see, the Bible says, uh, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's all we got to do is resist. Just a little while longer. But sometimes those chains are a little comfortable. Sometimes those chains bring a really deep sense of peace and security. Sometimes those chains are like a pacifier or a blankie. Sometimes those chains start calling your name. So when it comes time to kill sin and start pursuing after Christ is when the real challenge begins. It's when the war starts happening uh, on your doorstep. See, beforehand, you were just doing battle preparations and visiting this blacksmith. But the moment you start to resist it and kill it is when it rears its ugly head. And it does that because we use it as a coping mechanism and as security for so many years, and we just can't anymore. We just can't. And so it gets really difficult, it gets really hard, and we might feel depressed. We might feel anxious. We might feel worried. We might actually go into a rage and not be thinking straight because we no longer have access to these things that uh, we once did. And listen, church, I I really don't have time to break all of this down uh, for you um, because it is complex for each one of you. It's going to look different for each one of you um, because we... Reason with the word of God, we reckon that we're dead to sin, we resist sin, and then we replace sin with the things of God. And replacing sin is going to look, like I said, a lot different for a lot of you. Because some of you might have used alcohol as a coping mechanism. 
And now that you have to move on, you have to find something else. Uh, maybe you used uh, drugs as coping mechanisms, and now uh, you have to move on and, and find something else. And, and the real key to killing sin here is to replace it, not with worldly things, but with godly things. Replace the things you sought after sinfully with the things of God. And like I said, we're, we're going to talk about this in, in a future sermon. Um, in a few weeks, uh, we're going to be going through Romans, I think, 12 again. Uh, that'll be two weeks from now. Um, and we're going to look at some practical ways in which we can live out our faith. Um, but for the time being, I, I want to bring you to the book of Philippians. Oh, I flipped right there. Let's go. Come on. I want to bring you to the book of Philippians. And I want to share with you some things that uh, Paul encourages the church in Philippi with. And I think it will encourage you as well. Uh, finally, brethren, this is verse 8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, uh, are lovely, whatever things are good, of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, so church, we need to just resist sin. Um, we need to move past the old elementary stuff of, you know, how does Paul say it in Hebrews? I, I can't recall. But church, we need, to, we need to grow a little bit. We need to set aside sin and see it for what it is, and that it's death. And we need to reason with ourselves. And this is where it gets hard because I'm kind of getting in your face now. We need to reason with ourselves that God has called us dead to it. You are dead to it as a believer. And then he has called you to consider yourself dead to it. And that's where it gets tough. And then he calls you to resist it, to say, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. And that's when our flesh just gets mad. That's when we get mad. And then the word says, replace it. How many mothers are in the room here? How hard is it to uh, get your kid to stop sucking on a binky? I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm assuming it's hard if they do it. And, and, that's, what, and that's what sin is like. It's hard to, to get them off. It's going to take time. Um, there are some promises in the end of your bulletin that I want you to take a look at quick. Pull them up. End of your bulletin. Um, I want you to this week to look at those, and I want you to write them on your heart and truly believe them. There is nothing you did to earn this grace, the salvation that you have. There's nothing you can do to lose it. You are dead to sin. This is what Jesus says about This is what Paul says about you. Jesus... Holy Spirit, through inspiration, all that good stuff. Okay, they all said it. You are dead to sin. And it's going to take a little while. And it's going to hurt. And it's going to be rough. But that's what this process is about. And it's, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to jump from moment of salvation to fully sanctified in a day. It is going to take a while, church. So be patient. Grow in patience and meditate on the things of God and replace the sin that we clung so deeply to or replace it with godly things. And I don't know what that looks like for everybody. But we can work on it together. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that it is sufficient. God, you don't need me to, to expound on for hours and hours and hours. Um, Lord, you just, you just need your word. And it speaks life to us. So, Father, I pray that as we uh, just move into this time of, of singing praise to you, Lord, that our hearts would just be centered on the gospel. Jesus, that you lived a perfect life, you lived a righteous life, and you died that we might have life and have it abundantly. So, God, I pray that uh, we would put to death the sin in ourselves. God, that we would consider ourselves dead to sin that we would reason with your word that says we are dead to sin. And God, may we lose these chains and stop running back to them. 
Uh, and God, may we replace our sin, uh, what we ran back to, with righteous things. God, may we end uh, the need for, for foster ministry here in Yankton. Uh, may we just have foster parents lined up. God, may we end homelessness as the church. May we end hunger as the church. Lord, may we end uh, debt as a church. God, may we do incredible things because we're pursuing after you and growing more in your likeness. And God, I pray against the sin in this very room. Uh, Lord, may we cast it aside from us into the burning fire. God, may we move past it. Sanctify us with your truth. And your word is truth. So God, we run to you. We praise you. And God, we thank you most of all for your goodness and mercy and the power of the blood. Amen.